As soon as they got Julia Roberts to play the mom, 98% of the cast could have been played by garbage cans with googly eyes slapped on them and it would have been plenty of star power. <sighs> Award season. The Golden Globes are done, the BAFTAs are finished, but I think I speak for literally everyone when I say we're still reeling from Janelle Monáe's suit to the Grammys. Just... <laughs> wow. <laughs> Anyways, but let's be honest, here in America, the one we really care about is the Oscars. Even your I'm too good for culture friend cares a little bit about the Academy Awards. Despite declining viewership, the Oscars remain the most watched award series in the United States, with 32.9 million viewers tuning in last year. And it all begins with the nominations. The Shape of Water has the most this year, with 13 nominations in practically every category except for best makeup and hairstyling. But speaking of best makeup and hairstyling, the nominees this year are The Darkest Hour, Victoria and Abdul, and Wonder. Wonder, great. Wonder is the story of a kid named Augie who has a craniofacial disfigurement and is attending public school for the first time. He deals with bullying because of his appearance, but you know, eventually everyone is swayed by the wonderful, kind, disabled kid and it's super inspirational. You can't blend in when you were born to stand out. If you don't know anything about this movie, you might wonder why it was nominated for Best Makeup and Hairstyling. Well, that's because Jacob Tremblay, that kid from the Stressful Room movie, plays Augie. Jacob Tremblay, who is not disfigured. That is a mask. You might be thinking, well, yeah, that's so convincing, I didn't realize it was makeup. What artistry? It deserves the nomination. Uh, everything you just said was wrong. <laughs> Let me put it another way. If the Academy announced that Breakfast at Tiffany's was going to receive an honorary award for makeup, there would be outrage. Deserved outrage. But it wouldn't be because Rooney's appearance isn't a faithful portrayal of a Japanese caricature. It would be because we know that it's wrong to literally award a film for how well they turned a marginalized human being into a costume. Most of us are familiar with the minefield of controversy the casting has become. Whether it's to do with race, gender, or disability and disfigurement, miscasting in visual media is incredibly common and a long-standing tradition. Casting decisions are often made to maintain a status quo, which means that white people are often given roles that should go to actors of color, cisgender are given the roles of transgender, and able-bodied are given roles of disfigured and disabled. Though many of us who are not directly affected by these slights might find such spectacular instances of miscasting more amusing than anything else, for the people who aren't being represented, it's tremendously degrading. It is a cruel practice for those who wish to see their humanity and struggle acknowledged on screen, and a fantastic way to encourage bigoted, simplistic views to an ignorant viewer. Whitewashing in particular has gotten a lot of attention for its sins in recent years. Every few months we hear about another whitewashed role, and there's often a huge backlash. From Ghost in the Shell, to Pan, to Kubo and the Two Strings, to Iron Fist, to good lord, there's just so many of them. Sometimes this response enacts positive change. However, this level of scrutiny has not yet been extended to the misrepresentation of disfigurement and disability in film. And this particular kind of miscasting is not remotely new. The very category of best makeup and hairstyling was created because people were upset that The Elephant Man was not recognized for its makeup work at the Oscars. Who would like to guess what that film was about? A disfigured man! What a shock! Whoa, that's so surprising! Holy crap! Before I continue, you're going to hear me sometimes use disability and disfigurement interchangeably. This is not because they're the same thing. It's only because there's a lot shared between them, especially when it comes to representation. For example, Eliza in The Shape of Water is disfigured and disabled. Professor Xavier is disabled, but not disfigured. Quasimodo in Disney's The Hunchback of Notre Dame is disfigured, but not disabled. When a non-disabled actor is cast in a disabled role, it's generally referred to as cripping up. The Academy loves seeing non-disabled actors put on the affects of disability to tell an uplifting story. It's a contest! How good is this actor at stretching someone's life over his own skin? How good is she at portraying someone else's pain for that silly little statue? How well can they turn a person into a caricature? 
It's more than a little disgusting, to say the least, but we'll get to that. The most common excuses I hear for why we continue to cast able-bodied actors in these roles are the following. They had to cast a star for this role or no one would go see it. A disabled person couldn't meet the physical demands of the role. And saving the best for last, they chose the best person for the role. Answering those in order. Not everyone in your cast needs to already be a star. No movies would get made if those were the standards. Not only do we have technology powerful enough to completely change someone's physical appearance, I also regret to inform you that many of your favorite movies use body doubles. A non-disabled actor will never bring a more genuine performance than a disabled actor would. It will never happen. There is no one better to play a role than someone who actually lives that life. Cripping up prevents us from having meaningful conversations about disability and disabled representation. Involving disabled and disfigured people in front of and behind the camera can only improve your story about those topics. Let's Look at Me Before You, which came out in 2016, starring Amelia Clark and Sam Claflin. Sam Claflin played a man whose entire body had been paralyzed in an accident. He and Daenerys fall in love, but the movie still ends with him deciding to commit suicide because of his chronic pain, depression, and reliance on others. With disabled actors, this could have enabled a difficult conversation about disability and depriving disabled people of the autonomy to choose. But with non-disabled actors in these roles, what we got was the message that disabled people cannot experience a full life regardless of wealth, support, access to treatment, or anything, that they're better off dead. And shockingly, many movies about disability have this same message. And then there's The Shape of Water, which I immediately fell in love with upon seeing. And I will feel nothing as I tear it to shreds for you, the viewers. We could have had it Sally Hawkins plays the film's protagonist, Eliza Esposito, a nonverbal ASL signing janitor in 1963 Baltimore. So presumably, somewhere across town, this is also happening. Hey mama, welcome to the 60s! Sally Hawkins is not a disabled woman. And while she does an all right job of signing to my uneducated eye, her obvious rudimentary understanding of ASL has been remarked on by several people in the deaf and signing community. I wish we could spend more time talking about Eliza as a disabled character. How she was a woman content in her life before she falls in love. How I've never seen a woman masturbating like that in a film, where it wasn't framed as shameful or obviously meant to arouse the viewer, let alone a disabled woman. But we don't get to talk about those things. Instead, we have to think about the fact that a disabled person was excluded from a project that profited off of their life because they might make a non-disabled audience uncomfortable. Yeah, but why would you do this to me? Ah! <sighs> the good news is that this isn't the entirety of disabled and disfigured representation. ABC Speechless, about a family of five whose eldest son is nonverbal and uses a wheelchair due to cerebral palsy, actually cast an actor with cerebral palsy for the part. The show even partnered with the Cerebral Palsy Foundation to release guides and lessons that related to the themes of each episode, ranging from family dynamics to sex education. Joey Lucas from The West Wing, played by the amazing Marley Matlin, is a fantastic recurring deaf character who signs with an interpreter. With Matlin, we get to see actual, fluent ASL on screen. And because Dustin's disfigurement in Stranger Things is the same one that Gaten Matarazzo has, and because of his willingness to talk about that condition, there are so many people who know what cleidocranial dysplasia is who otherwise probably wouldn't have any reason to care. And they're all making a living representing themselves. When you get disabled and disfigured people involved in your projects, it resonates more than it would if you just got some random non-disabled guy. So if it is possible to cast the right people for these stories and their impact is positive, why do we still get crap like wonder? I imagine it's because it's a lot more comforting to us non-disfigureds to know that Jacob Tremblay isn't really that ugly. It's just a mask. And if we know that he can take it off when he's done, we don't have to think about how disfigurement makes us uncomfortable. Or critique how often we equate disfigurement with evil incarnate. She is the perfect example of these humans. Destroy her, Diana. You know that she deserves it. For f**k's sake! Knowing that Sam Claflin doesn't really need a full-time nurse or suffer from chronic pain means you can get off on watching his character struggle without feeling guilty. Because if it's just make-believe, then there's no need for change. 
then you don't have to confront the fact that seeing that character suffer makes you feel better about yourself. And maybe, just maybe, that's a terrible reason. Thanks for watching.